Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now podcasting from scenic Colorado Springs, Colorado, here's your host, Jason Day. Hello and welcome, friends, to the Church Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Day, and I believe you will find this week's episode so encouraging. I know I did. I had the privilege of talking with Gary Poole, one of the foremost outreach strategists in the world. Gary has a very unique approach to how we embrace God's mission of reaching those who are far from him with the hope of Jesus. Gary is a best-selling author and has served as a church planter, lead pastor, and evangelism and missions pastor, leading thousands to learn how to share their faith effectively. Through his ministry, One Life Advisors, Gary helps churches shift their culture and increase their evangelism temperature as they impact their communities for Christ. Now, on this week's episode, Gary and I discuss why many churches today are struggling with evangelism. Gary shares insights from his experiences of developing outreach strategies that are not formulaic, that build trust with those who do not yet follow Jesus, and that can be embraced by people from every generation. We talk about the emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit and how to be intentional in evangelism without viewing people merely as projects. Now, our conversation is packed with prayerful, thoughtful, actionable insights, so I invite you to join me in my conversation with Gary Poole. Gary, I'm so glad that you could join us today. Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast. Thank you very much, Jason. Good to be with you. Yeah, now, I'm really excited, as as we shared just a little bit before uh, we jumped on here, about today's topic and what we're going to really dig into. It's something that's very close to my heart, and um, one, one thing that... I think we we need to just take the time to be intentional about and to think through and to pray through in our local churches, and that is uh, this idea of evangelism. But in your experience, Gary, as we look around kind of uh, the landscape of churches, specifically here in North America, uh, why, why do you think churches are struggling with evangelism so much? Yeah, well, uh, I agree with your premise, first of all, that churches are struggling with evangelism. Uh, I go around the country, and I meet with churches and pastors, and I ask them this question. I say, on a scale from 1 to 10, what is your evangelism temperature at your church? How well are your people doing with evangelism? How well are your leaders doing with evangelism, your your staff? And inevitably, they rate themselves very low. On a scale of 1 to 10, they're around a 3 or 4 mm. or maybe a 2. And I've had some pastors say, I think we're in the negatives, you know. Right, right. <laughs> and it's uh, it's a struggle. I think our culture is changing, which is making evangelism difficult. I think people are, are shrinking back because it's not politically correct. I think people are afraid of being asked questions that they may not be able to answer. Um, they're not even sure how to actually bring up the topic, how to engage in spiritual conversations. So it's becoming a real issue, and that's one of the things that I'm most passionate about doing is we've identified some pilot churches that are are working with us, we're working with them to help raise their evangelistic temperature and try to figure out how to crack this code and, and break through the, the barriers. And uh, so it's it's been a challenge. Uh, I think churches also have kind of uh, assumed that people maybe have relationships with non-Christians or maybe inviting them to the services, um, and maybe evangelism is happening that way. Um, I think churches need to develop a very specific evangelism strategy and a very specific evangelism training program and even a coaching program to help um, cheerlead people to keep going, even though it gets challenging. So um, it's, there's a lot of work to be done in this area. Yeah, yeah, that's good, Gary. And let's talk a little bit about this idea of evangelism strategy, um, because yeah. uh, I, I too travel the country. You know, talk a lot about um, you know do coaching and training on on this the same topic, and and you know we talk a lot about this idea of of us having to be intentional. Um, yeah. But sometimes uh, pastors, ministry leaders, others might push back a little bit and say, "Well, this should be something that just flows naturally." So, can you talk a little bit about? Um, you know, why Why is it important that we do have to be intentional? Why is strategy not necessarily, a, you know, a bad word when it comes to the idea of evangelism? You know, I think people shrink back a little bit from the, the idea of a strategy uh, or intentionality because it then looks like we have, um, we've earmarked uh, non-Christians and put a target on their back and we've 
turn them into our project. Mm. And that's the last thing we really want to do is we, we don't want anyone to feel like they're our project and that we're manipulating situations to turn it into an evangelistic opportunity. But at the same time, as much as we want to steer away from that orientation of viewing people as projects, we also realize that you must be intentional if you're ever going to do anything when it comes to evangelism. It's just not really going to happen by accident. So there has to be some level of taking a step, being intentional, um, being purposeful in your efforts to engage in spiritual conversations, or it's just not naturally going to happen. Now, I do believe, that being said, I do believe that it, there are ways to make it natural. Mm. I believe it. Uh, there's ways to make evangelism uh, such a positive experience for both Christians and non-Christians that they are looking forward to having spiritual conversations. So a lot of it is the methodology, and that's what we train people on, is, okay, how do we engage in spiritual conversations in such a way that it's actually attractive to non-Christians and, non- and Christians, and how do we make it a positive experience, and how do we help people take steps in their spiritual journey? So uh, I, I do believe that it it starts with being intentional. Yeah, that's good, Gary. Let's let's walk down that road a little bit because uh, I think um, you know what you've said really hits on uh, maybe a couple things that that people tend to push back on. One is, of course, this idea of you know if it's too formulaic, then it's this idea of you know we're targeting people, which I love the way you spoke about that. And you know, and people you know who aren't like us or outside the church become our projects. So I I love you touching on that. But let's kind of walk through this. Um, how yeah. how you talk about this idea that because a lot of people fear evangelism we just we see that in our right. churches right a lot of people and a lot of people kind of uh, whether deliberately or not you know will will use the excuse well my spiritual gift isn't evangelism and you know right. uh, of course that that's not a you know get out of jail free card for anybody right because we're all um, if you're a Christ follower and following in the footsteps of Christ well Jesus um, was a natural evangelist so you can't really you know, say, well, that's just not my thing. So talk to us a little bit. How, how can we make that shift or begin to make that shift where people don't view evangelism as something that is either uh, kind of uh, creepy, you know, because we're targeting mm-hmm. people or scary, you know, or something to be afraid of because, you know, it's just not in our wheelhouse. So how do you help people kind of get through that? Well, you know, we take it in stages. Um, I think, I love what you said, too, as far as not making it formulaic or mechanical. We emphasize an approach that's organic and natural, mm. but um, at the same time is intentional. So we <laughs> yeah, we yeah. actually have a little bit of a formula, you might say, for a non-formulaic approach, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you got to figure out a way to talk about this organic approach and, uh, and, and how to train people in that. And so, I mean... One of the first places we start um, is really a a fun exercise that we do in all of our trainings, and that's where we uh, split up the room. You know, it's filled with Christians who want to learn, okay, how do I share my faith? How do I engage in spiritual conversations with non-Christians? And we split the room in half right down the middle, and we say, okay, those of you on this side of the room, I want you to discuss all the reasons why non-Christians avoid Christians. And then we say to the other side of the room, all of you discuss all the reasons why Christians avoid non-Christians. And I give them like 15, 20 minutes to brainstorm all the ideas, all the bullet points they can come up with as to why there's this avoidance factor going on. And it's unbelievable. I, can, I, I have a hard time cutting them off and stopping because there are multiple reasons why non-Christians are avoiding Christians. And, uh, you know, the corollary of that is, Christians are avoiding non-Christians. And so to answer your question, I think one of the first things to, I, to do to overcome this obstacle or this challenge is to identify what the problems are. What are the obstacles? What are the roadblocks and barriers that are keeping people uh, you know, apart from each other, uh, these two groups apart from each other and not engaging in spiritual conversations? And some of these we've already touched on. Um, you know, Christians are afraid that they're not going to be able to answer questions. They're afraid that um, they're going to be misconstrued, they're not be, going to be public, uh, politically correct, that they're going to turn their non-Christian friends into projects, and, and non-Christians are afraid that they're going to be judged and preached at and lectured and not heard and understood and devalued in the process. And, and so we brainstorm all, this, all, all these ideas, and we say, okay, what if we were to develop a strategy that 
actually minimized these obstacles and brought people together to be able to have these spiritual conversations, what would that look like? As a result, we have developed this strategy. I've developed it over the years in my experience working with churches, and uh, and we have a, a, a process that actually honors uh, non-Christians in this in this you know experience of engaging in spiritual conversation. So it's a pretty powerful exercise, and then it actually lays the foundation for what the strategy actually is and how how powerful it can be yeah that's 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 excellent and this is um i've I've read a bit about the trainings that you do and how you help kind of equip and encourage people and this is the the 3d1 can you walk us through a little bit um what exactly does that 3d1 you know what what does that mean and how does that help us begin thinking maybe differently about about how we might approach um our friends with with our faith story well, you know, and just to give you a little background real sure. quick before diving into this, um, I think of this strategy that we're going to unpack as as what we ask the congregation to do. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest challenges, too, is that Christians aren't sure what the expectation is from their church mm. as to what mm. it means to do evangelism. That's good. What is that, and what is the expectation? And so this strategy, this 3D1 that I'll unpack in a minute, is basically all the congregation, the average congregation member needs to know. This is the expectation. This is the quote-unquote approach uh, that is non-formulaic, organic, non-mechanical. It's natural. Um, now, that being said, there is a strategy behind this strategy, which is a strategy for a church on how to implement this evangelism initiative okay. for the congregation, and that includes uh, a whole bunch of things that we could get into if you want to in this in this interview um, about preparing the staff, preparing the elders, preparing the leadership. Uh, one of our mantras is we don't want to ask the congregation to do something we're not willing to do ourselves first. Yes, yeah, good. And so there's a lot of behind the scenes kinds of things, and how do we prepare? How do we train people? Uh, sh- how do we identify an evangelism point person that's actually going to lead this initiative? Because when we work with churches, we don't want to do what we call a one and done, where we just come in and do training, and then we're gone, and then we don't. A year later, we don't see the impact. We want this to be a DNA shift, a culture shift that actually impacts the congregation over the long term and is sustainable. So that's you need to know that as the underlying kind of a approach to this strategy that I'm going to unpack for you. Good. That there's there's a there's a, a whole strategy for implementing this. Okay. Excellent. So, but but let me just jump into it then for you. Uh, the 3D1 is really very simple. It's easy to remember. It, it sounds like a formula, but it's really, <laughs> it's just a way to talk about a very simple, natural approach. The one simply stands for a one life. It's one person who is far from God that is in your circle of influence, your sphere of influence. It's Maybe someone where you live, or someone where you work, or someone uh, nearby where you play. You know, we talk in those terms. Uh, wherever you're doing life, who in your sphere of influence is God putting on your heart that you might be able to pray for and maybe begin to develop a friendship and then maybe engage in spiritual conversations. So, again, this is something that's designed to be very simple. We, we're asking everyone in the congregation to at least pick one person that God has put on their heart uh, to reach. Now, um, you know, this is where we get back to our conversation about making sure that they're not a project. And we talk about how we want God to open up doors for us. We're praying for God to open our eyes to be able to see who's around us and where can we develop some natural inroads to developing this friendship with this one person and not view them as a project, not with a target on their back, but someone who matters to God and therefore matters to us. So it starts with just starting with one person. Now, some some people in the congregation will say, I've got more than one person. <laughs> or, or many times when we go to churches, most, ironically, most Christians don't have non-Christian friendships. Um, and so they say, okay, Help me start with identifying one person. And so we do a lot of training and encouragement to try to help people identify that one person. But that's where it starts. It starts with 
See, seeing in your world, who might God be calling you to reach and who can you be praying for? And then once you've identified your one life, then that's where the three D's come into play. So the three D one strategy is the one stands for your one life and the three, three D stands for three D's of the process of what to do with your one life. And it's very, very simple. The first D is to develop friendships. And that is to develop an authentic, genuine, ongoing friendship with your non-Christian one life. Um, to be intentional based on your common, common interests, uh, to hang out together, uh, to build bridges of trust. Um, that's one of the one things, thing, one, one, the one thing that's lacking in relationships between Christians and non-Christians is a low level of trust. Mm. Uh, there's very little trust. And so, we talk about that. I can come back to these. I'll just give you the overview real quick. Okay. Uh, the second D is discover stories. And this is the real paradigm shift in evangelism um, in our strategy. It's, it's to invite Christians to discover the story of their one life, uh, to ask them questions and to really listen and to understand where people are coming from, not just from a spiritual perspective, but also just their life story. And to to really, you know, dive deep into, you know, their life experiences and so forth. And, you know, in many ways, uh, evangelism strategies uh, or training programs emphasize the Christian telling his or her story to the non-Christian and then telling God's story, the gospel. But in our strategy, we emphasize not only those aspects, but also earning the right to tell your story by first hearing their story. So one of our, our quotes is, seek first to understand before seeking to be understood. And it's the idea of really understanding somebody's story and asking questions and listening to their story and really getting to know them so that they're showing empathy, uh, seeing, per, the, seeing things from their perspective or through their eyes and being be able in being able to really develop even more trust because you value your non-Christian one life because you care enough to ask about their story. You know, on a side note here, um, one of the reasons why non-Christians don't like evangelism so much is that they feel devalued in the process. Mm. And one of the ways to help a person feel valued is when they feel heard and understood. And most non-Christians don't feel heard and understood. They feel judged. They feel preached at. They feel feel uh, misunderstood. And this part of this this part of the process, the second D, is really to help people feel valued and cared for because we hear we care enough to hear their story. And then the third D is discern next steps. So we've got develop friendships, uh, develop a genuine friendship with your one life, discover stories. Uh, understand and empathize where your one life is coming from, really get to know their story, help them to feel valued. And the third step is discern next step. And this is where we ask Christians to pray and rely on the wisdom and discernment from the Holy Spirit to know what the best next step is to take with your one life Mm. and what might be their best next step to take in their spiritual journey. And so we ask people to pray and based on what they understand or learn from their story, figure out, okay, what would be their best next step? How can I help them to take steps in their spiritual journey? How can I extend an invitation to them, maybe an invitation to church or an invitation to hang out? You know, maybe even it's just to develop a friendship and hang out at a game or go out for dinner or something, and then maybe to invite them eventually to church or to a spiritual discovery group discussion or something, or maybe invite them to receive Christ at some point. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, discerning next steps is really discerning, okay, how do I invite my one life to take a next step, and how can I influence them in a spiritual way? So that's a real quick overview, Jason, of the of the three Ds, and I'd uh, love to hear what your thoughts are on those. Yeah, yeah, Gary, I, I absolutely love it. I, I love it because it isn't a formula, but it does provide some guidance um, so that we can indeed be intentional, um, yet yet give space for... Um, kind of the natural, organic uh, growth in a relationship, which I think is absolutely key because uh, in in my experience, uh, the one thing that I've seen that backfires is, uh, just as you said, um, whenever whenever someone goes through um, maybe some sort of evangelism training and it's kind of a 
a simple formula and then they want to go out and just kind of target that person and walk them through those steps um, with the thought that, you know, after, you know, step A, B, C, when they get to step D, something happens uh, and and two things happen. One, the person that um, they're attempting to evangelize, as you've said, you know, feels like, wait a second, what, you know, what's going on? You know, because it's just, it's not a natural thing. It's, um, right. it's something that has been, you know, pieced together without giving a whole lot of thought necessarily to that person's life, um, aside right. from the fact that they're far from God, right? I mean, that's the only thought that's really kind of given. And then in turn, that makes the person who's sharing their faith or trying to walk someone through that, it makes them feel like, a, either a failure, right, in some yeah. sense, because it seems like uh, the results are based on this formula and how well you can present this particular formula, or it makes right. them just feel kind of icky about sharing their faith. And and then what I find is, you know, they they don't they don't want to ever again. You know, like they they're like that just because they can sense themselves that that isn't, you know, it's not coming from a place of of grace and love and compassion necessarily other than the fact that they know they're far from God. So yeah. so I love I love this this idea this guidance that it provides because it focuses on not just the task or the mission but it literally focuses on the other person which is exactly yeah. what we see in Christ. Right? When we read the gospels, exactly what we see in Christ is his concern for the other person as a person and not just for some ultimate goal or, uh, you know, a box that you can tick. Yeah, you've, you've hit on uh, several really good, powerful points about this strategy. It's We like to say that it's uh, other-centric or other-focused. It's, it's focusing evangelism on the other person and, and maybe recognizing how they're going to perceive it, how they're going to receive this uh, spiritual conversation. It's not... Um, self-centered. In, in other words, it's not trying to figure out, okay, how do I do evangelism in such a way that I can check it off my list and microwave the process and get it done with, you know, right. really quick. You know, it's, it's, no, it's, it's focused on a process that would honor the non-Christian and really help them take spiritual steps in a genuine way. And it is a focus on developing this genuine relationship with the person where you really do come to care about them. I mean, um, and this is not to say that you can't do evangelism with someone who you just, just meet. You can't, it's not right. saying that you can't do evangelism with a complete stranger, but this particular approach and the strategy is designed to help people develop genuine friendships with non-Christians so that they can earn the right to have these kinds of spiritual conversations on an ongoing basis. Um, and to recognize that evangelism is a process, um, and it takes time uh, for people to process and to a- ask their questions and explore them over time, and that you want to be with them along the way, along the journey, all along the process. So it's pretty, it's a pretty cool way of building a friendship. It actually is a model for discipleship. Mm. Beyond when someone comes to Christ, um, you actually now have this relationship with someone where you can help disciple them and help mentor them and help them to grow in their spiritual faith because you have the relationship with them. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And I can see that. I know I love the um, the third D, uh, discern next steps, because I think oftentimes, oftentimes what we do is we, we get so caught up in what we're trying to accomplish uh, that that we forget, you know, God wants to see this person come to Christ more than we ever would, right? So, um, and so the Holy Spirit is at work. And, and yeah. sometimes I think we do not uh, develop, uh, take time to develop a sensitivity to how the Holy Spirit is at work. Um, yeah. And so we kind of, you know, rush ahead of, of what the Holy Spirit's trying to do just to try to, you know, accomplish what we think we need to accomplish rather than oftentimes what I have found is that you need to slow down because, you know, mm-hmm. the, the person is is wrestling through some some. It's oftentimes some very dramatic things in their lives that you may not even know at this point, and yet the Holy Spirit knows. And so, yeah. so the, this whole idea of discerning those next steps, and then I see, just as you said, Gary, this naturally um, rolls right into you know lifelong disciple making and uh, discipleship and growth because you're continuing to do, you're continuing to 
deepen that friendship and and listen to their stories of their life and continue to discern how the Holy Spirit's at work in the midst of it. And it just it just never stops. You know, once they've committed their lives to to Christ and they start that journey, um, it just this this whole idea just keeps going and going and going. And that really truly is what you know discipling someone is all about, right? Yes, yes. You know, I love your emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit in the process of evangelism, and I agree with that 100%. I mean, sometimes in our training, we'll, we'll even use the phrase where we'll, we'll say, you know, we as Christians are facilitators of this process, but then we get ourselves out of the way to let the Holy Spirit do the work of conversion. I mean, only God can save someone. Right. We can't save anyone, but we are invited to be facilitators of the process. We're invited to be God's ambassadors and his representatives, and so we can facilitate a process of discovery. And that's how we view this strategy, is that we're just facilitating an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to do his work in someone's life in convicting them and converting them. And, uh, you know, you mentioned, too, to slow down the process. I agree with that. It is a fine line also, because I do believe strongly in the urgency of the gospel, Mm -hmm. you know, and that we are to call people to repent and to receive Christ now. Now is the day of salvation, and that the time is now. Um, Time is of of the essence, but at the same time, we leave the conversion to God and His timing, and that we're facilitators of the process. So it sort of, in some ways, takes the pressure off, um, but at the same time, it, it gives us something to actually do and be intentional about, pretty powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. I love that. You know, it's interesting. Oftentimes, um, you know, as, as you're talking about this one life and developing this this friendship and in the balance between, you know, making sure it's it's not, you know, some project, you know, and helping people think through that, I think, is, has, has been one of the, the bigger challenges that I faced is helping people think through and not allow it to become a project. And I know one of the things that, that I've often said is, Whenever you're, you know, praying for this person, God's laid this person on your heart and you're, you know, developing that friendship and deepening that friendship, you have to approach it in such a way that if that person were to never commit their lives to Christ, you're still going yeah. to be their friend, right? And, yeah. and that kind of takes away the whole project piece of it. You know, it helps you stay intentional, like you said, and, and still have that urgency. But but yeah. the idea, but it kind of removes that idea of they're a project. You know, this is someone we care yeah. about. This is someone God cares about. And so we are going to have this friendship, but we're going to have this friendship regardless if they ever accept an invitation from us to go to church or to, you know, hang out with a small group or do a mission trip or, you know, it it just, this, the perspective we have to have is, you know, again, I I love that, that language that you use, this kind of other centric. Well, you know, um, one thing to understand about this approach is that it is cyclical, not linear. So in other words, we have a diagram of this 3D1 approach, and it's a circle with arrows, and it's an ongoing process. It's cyclical as opposed to one, two, three, and you're done, mm. um, um, or just follow these steps, and then you move on to the next person. This is, you know, develop a friendship, hang out with them, uh, maybe go to the ball game, find out what you have in common, do those things together, build a friendship about that commonality. And then over time, discover their story, get to know who they are, get to know where they are spiritually. I mean, there's so many questions you can ask to get to know someone, uh, someone's spiritual story without putting them on the spot. I mean, you know, what we found is non-Christians love to tell their story, and, to, and they love talking about their spiritual experience. They just don't like, you know, <laughs> doing that with Christians, because Christians, in many ways, and again, I'm generalizing, right, right. are too busy telling their story and not listening to them, their, mm. you know, their, their one life story. And so it's almost like they're not stopping, stopping talking long enough to hear their story, you know? That's good. And so we put a lot of, I have a lot of fun with it and we emphasize, you know, this is the time to really listen. And I really do believe in the power of listening in evangelism in many ways over the years when I've led spiritual discovery groups or seeker small groups or had these encounters with people, I like to say that I listened them into the kingdom. I didn't talk them into the kingdom. <laughs> that's I just good. asked questions and listened. And so that's a that's part of this process too is to discover their story over time and then to discern next steps and 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 to be continually taking the best next step and going back to developing the friendship and hearing more of their story and then based on the story that you learn, 
you know, figure out what the best next step might be, which might be to just develop the friendship more, or Mm -hmm. the best next step might be to go back to the second D and discover their story, or it could be to pray for them and to maybe give them a resource or to serve them or to extend an invitation, you know, and it's just this ongoing process of engaging the person through these three Ds. It's just a simple tool of a way of reminding people what to do right. when it comes to evangelism. That's good. That's good. Let me ask you, Gary, because um, I'm, I'm curious, um, as you travel uh, to, to different churches and you're helping the, the churches themselves, the leadership implement this, but then also training the people, do you sense that people within our churches today – do you sense that they are more interested or less interested in sharing their faith? Do you, have, do you have a sense on that? That's a great question. I think as I travel, I'll answer it in two ways. I think people are more hesitant and more fearful mm-hmm. because of the culture that we are in, finding ourselves in and, right. and so forth. But I think they're more eager to figure out how to overcome those obstacles. So when we do our trainings or when we go to churches, we find that Christians are convicted with this and they're saying, you know, I don't know what to do. Help us. I'm not sure where to start. I want to be a part of this. I know this is our calling from God. This is the Great Commission. Uh, This is what life is all about, is to know God and have a relationship with Him and uh, to follow Him. And, and yet I'm not sure how to engage my neighbors or my coworkers or my friends at the gym. And so people are hungry and looking for a process that they could actually do. And in spite of the fears and some of the roadblocks that they sense in the culture. Now, what's interesting, when we go to the pilot, we've got, uh, we've got now six pilot churches that are actually implementing this. And one of the things that surprised me is how the churches have said that the the formula, you you know, quote unquote formula, the 3D1 mm-hmm. approach has helped their church so much because it's given them common language to talk about it. Mm. Yeah. And so now they're able to share stories and they're able to talk about each other's one life. And at first there was some hesitancy. They're saying, well, if we talk about our one life at church, you know, we tell our stories about our experience with our one life. What happens if somebody's one life is in the service and they hear about it? <laughs> uh, yeah. Won't they, won't they feel like a project? And uh, we found that we've talked about it in such a positive way um, that we, uh, there's actually this tipping point that happens with our pilot churches where they talk about it and they share these stories where they're demonstrating so much respect and honor toward non-Christians that when non-Christians hear that this is what it means to be someone's one life, that you want to care about them and build bridges of trust, and you want to hear their story, and you want to seek first to understand, and you want to discern next steps. You don't want to be pushing them or you know, judging them or, or taking them along your agenda. You really want to hear you know, what is God's agenda for their life or what is what are their questions? And so it's so tailored, or like you said, other-centric, that they feel honored that this is how Christians are now viewing evangelism, and that's something that they want to be a part of. So um, our pilot churches have been talking to us about how this common language has helped the church to actually talk about it on a regular basis and share stories, and they do so without uh, any, you know, embarrassment or shame, they're saying, this is our strategy, and this is how we're helping people find a relationship with God through Christ, and it's changing people's lives. But it's provided this common language, you know, so now everybody's talking about their one life. You know, I I can tell you this story. When we first came up with this concept, I was actually uh, visiting a church, and we talked about the one life in one of the services. But the next day, I was at a coffee shop, and I was overhearing, it just happened by chance, I was overhearing a conversation between two women who were sharing about going to church the previous Sunday, you know, the, right. the previous day <laughs> on Sunday. And the one woman said, she kind of whispered in her, in her tone was, I'm so amazed. My one life came to church with me yesterday. And the other person said, she did. How did that go? What did she say? And they were super excited. And she said, she loved it. 
And and the other person said, well, my one life hasn't come to church with me yet, but I'm still praying, you know, that might be the next step with them. And I was so proud of them and actually inter- interjected in, in their conversation. I said, listen, I can't help myself. I overheard <laughs> you talking about your one life. I'm I'm assuming you're talking about, you know, this church that we, we went to and they were saying yes. And I loved it because here were two people. They weren't on staff. They weren't elders. They were just regular members of the congregation, right. and they were engaged in the evangelism process, praying for each other's one life, and they had a common language to talk about it. It was pretty cool. I love that. That's the prayer of every pastor right there. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, yeah. That's what we, uh, what we are praying to see happen. Yeah. Gary, um, it sounds as if um, this, this kind of strategy, this, this, uh, this kind of way to walk through you know, developing these friendships and, and ultimately you know, sharing our faith, it sounds as if this could work, this is going to sound strange, but could work with anyone. <laughs> um, and, and what I mean by, like, um, it doesn't, you know, I think so often when we look at different evangelism strategies, they seem to be kind of locked into a particular maybe generation or a particular yeah. type of person even um, or a yeah. particular stage of life. Uh, but but the openness, you know, kind of the, the organic aspect of, of this strategy seems that it would, you know, it's, it, regardless if you're a millennial or you're um, a boomer, um, that it could work. Have you seen that? Yeah, Jason. Uh, Jason, I love your insights on this. I think you're exactly right. Um, that's what we're finding from our pilot churches. Um, you know, a lot of times when it comes to evangelism, um, the average member of a church or a Christian will say, you know, I'm not gifted in evangelism. We got to leave it up to the gifted evangelists, or I'm going to leave it up to the professionals, the, the, the staff or the senior pastor. And in fact, I had one friend of mine say, you know, my strategy for evangelism is to do nothing because I know that when I try to do something, I'm doing more harm than good. So I, I'm actually helping when I do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, but that's a lot of the fears that the average Christian has. But you're exactly right. We are finding that this approach is actually freeing up the average Christian so that everyone, no matter what their age or, or matter what, where they're at in life, or what they think their spiritual gift is, they can engage in this process. It's, and you know, when we take people through the training, they are so excited because they say, yeah, I can start with one person, and it gives me something that I can actually do. I can develop a friendship with them. I can discover their stories, ask questions and listening, listen. I can pray and ask God to give me wisdom as to what the next step is. It, it, it's, a, it's an opportunity for everyone to get in the game and engage in the evangelism process and engage in spiritual conversations with someone that they care about dearly, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. And that, I think that's so critical because, you know, there, there's so much conversation, so many blog posts and books, and, um, you know, I've done episodes, you know, podcast episodes on this or, or about, you know, how are we going to, you know, reach the next generation or how are we going, you know, like that's, that's just one of those things that's very, very real. Um, in the church, and it seems like the, this approach, as you've said, and you've said you, you've witnessed this and seen this, which I think is beautiful. Um, it seems like this is one of those ways that we can can really cross a lot of those, um, you know, a lot of those things that we've maybe have, have viewed as obstacles or barriers in some way, especially with the the way yeah. that our culture is is changing and will continue to change. I mean, it's not like yeah. um, something that's that's just going to stop. Uh, so, so I see the, um, I guess uh, for, for lack of a better word, I mean, there's hope, <laughs> um, yes. in this, you know what I mean? And, and I love the fact that you, you have the opportunity to, to see this taking root in, in churches that you're working with now. And, and really, I think this is a beautiful thing and beautiful opportunity for the church, you know, capital C church to embrace in, in the world in which we live today. Yes, you know, that's our prayer, is as we work with these various pilot churches, we're praying that they will see um, progress and and see God working in their life, raising their evangelistic temperature, Mm -hmm. and all of our pilot churches have said that they've seen that, and that other churches will take note, and they'll say, wow, how did you guys do that? What did you guys do? What did you learn? How can we implement something similar? And we're trying to create a movement to actually change what we started this phone call talking about, which is the low temperature of evangelism in our church across right. the country, and how can we raise it? And so 
this is one way of how we're trying to make a dent and to make an impact. Um, we're we're learning all kinds of things in this approach. You know, this process. We're, yeah. We're helping to coach the, 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 the senior pastors and coach the staff. We're identifying evangelism point leaders for church. Many churches don't have an evangelism point person, you know, mm-hmm. that's focused on this. We're learning how to train the congregation and how to coach them. We're figuring out, okay, how do we leverage outreach services or outreach events so that people actually are bringing non-Christians instead of assuming that they are, you know, and how do we get more intentional? So. It's been a really cool learning process. It's a long process. I mean, we, we say when we work with a pilot church, we want to work with them for about a year because this, we know, is, a, is an ongoing process of trying to, in, you know, change the culture, right. shift the culture so that it becomes more oriented in this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we know that culture doesn't shift overnight. So I, I love exactly. kind of the long-term approach that you guys are taking. Uh, Gary, honestly— you know, this is something I'm very passionate about. We could talk forever on this, but but I'm thinking about the pastors and mystery leaders who are listening in right now, and and um, hopefully, you know, I mean, I'm pumped up, I'm excited, but hopefully, they're encouraged as well as I've heard a lot of what you've shared, Gary. If if they want to learn more about how how perhaps they can um, begin implementing this in their church, you know, whether it's a, you know, a small rural church or an urban church, or I imagine it it sounds again, like this, this would work in any church, honestly, how could they learn more, um, from you, uh, from your team about this approach and what, what would next steps for someone who's listening in and it feels like, man, I've been praying for, for something like this to be able to shift the culture in our church and help us really make an impact in our community. What would the next steps for them be? Yes, well, uh, a couple of steps I would recommend. One is they could just reach out to me directly, and uh, you know we can post my contact information. Um, we actually are starting to form our organization called we're calling ourselves One Life Advisors. Okay. One Life Advisors, and we're actually helping churches identify their One Life strategy and mobilizing their congregation to reach their One Lives with the three Ds. So um, I'm happy to give you my contact information. Uh, I mean, I can give you my email over the phone, too, actually right now. Yeah, yeah. Give, or, give it to us. And we'll also make sure that we put it in the show notes for this episode. Yes. So if someone's you know, driving down the road and listening, um, they, they can you know, pick it up later. So go ahead and share. What, what, what's the best way to, to connect with you? Yes. Um, so you could contact me at Gary at onelifeadvisors.com. Okay. Gary, and it's two R's in Gary, so it's G-A-R-R-Y at onelifeadvisors.com. So that's our email address, and we've got a number of people that are helping us uh, with working with churches. So we've got a team of people, and we can get back to you guys and uh, follow up with you if you're interested in, in exploring this option for your church. Excellent. Now, um, is onelifeadvisors.com a website that they could go yes, to learn more as well? Yes, okay. it is. Yes, Excellent. It is. Yeah. Well, we will definitely um, have that information in the show notes so you guys can reach out to Gary directly uh, and learn more about um, about this movement across the world. You know, this is this is something that I think, uh, you know, will work uh, in any, any context. So um, it's a beautiful yes. thing. Love what you're doing, Gary. Super excited to have had you with us today and excited to, um, we'll have to have you back on and and talk more and, and hear more about some of the stories coming out of out of churches as they're embracing this. So thank you so much. You know, for, it, would be, you know it would be really fun. I, I what's know that? I yeah. out this idea right here on the podcast, but yeah. uh, we could have a couple of our pastors on the phone call. We could interview them together that have actually been implementing them. Uh, their enthusiasm and excitement is contagious because um, they, they've they actually seen it firsthand. Yeah. And that could be a really powerful thing. And that's the other thing, too, is if anybody's interested, you know, just reach out to us at our at our website, onelifeadvisors.com, or reach out to me, and we can put you in contact with these with these pastors as well that have already been implementing this over the last several months and, and last year or so. That's excellent. Gary, thank you for taking the time to be with us. Love to hear what you're doing. And like I said, I'm, I'm excited to see how, how the Spirit's going to move through this and, um, and how we're going to see an awesome, awesome harvest as people come to place their faith and their trust and place their lives in the hands of Christ. So thank you so much for all that you and your team are doing. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your encouragement. All right. God bless you, brother. 
I appreciate you taking the time to be with us on this week's episode. Every week as we are putting the episodes together, we're thinking of you, our pastors and ministry leaders, and striving to provide insightful and inspiring interviews as you seek to grow as a kingdom leader. So we hope you're finding value from the Church Leaders Podcast. And if so, we'd certainly appreciate you taking a few moments to head over to iTunes and leave us a review. Your positive reviews and ratings help other church leaders more easily find our podcasts so they too can benefit from these interviews. Again, we thank you in advance. And if you have any comments, any questions, suggestions, or ideas for guests, I would love to hear from you. You can send me an email to podcast at churchleaders.com, or you can connect with me on Twitter. Finally, you can find this podcast as well as other great faith-based podcasts on the Faith Play app. It's available for both Apple and Android. And so we encourage you to check that out as well. So until next time, this is Jason Day, encouraging you to love well and lead well. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website at churchleaders.com. 